You are such a genuine gem. Thank you for clicking on my video. I'm Burke McKenna, but today's video is about a makeup millionaire's daughter who disappeared. This is the Dorothy Arnold case. Now, this was a young girl, an innocent day, and a mysterious ending. What happened to her? No suspects were ever found, and neither was she. By the way, this is my absolute passion to tell these stories, so if you would like to support me in this, all you have to do is subscribe and watch these videos, and it means the absolute world. Now let's get back to the story. So it was 1910 in New York City, and Dorothy Harriet Camille Arnold was born there to Francis and Mary. Now, she was the second of four children. She was born into an extremely wealthy family, and her father, Francis, was a Harvard graduate who eventually became senior partner at the F.R. Arnold & Co., which was like a fancy goods importing company, and they would sell things like perfume and makeup and made millions of dollars doing so. Now, the Arnolds were so wealthy that when Dorothy was born, her name was instantly registered on the social register. Now, if you're like me and have no idea what that is, it's basically a published list of people in high society. And she was instantly put on it as a child just for being in the Arnold family. Dorothy was a happy and funny and smart and fashionable girl who attended the Velton School for Girls before heading to Brian Maurer College for Literature and Language. She loved to write. She loved anything to do with English. She fit right in with the high society, the extravagant parties. It was just part of her nature. She just naturally, she grew up in the situation and she thrived in it. And in 1905, she graduated college and she would go live back with her parents and continue her writing career. So at 108 East 79th Street, this 5'4 beautiful woman was typing away, working towards her career that she would love. However, their luck was about to change because on December 12th, of 1910, Dorothy would go missing. That day she had left and gone to the shops because she was going to pick up a dress for her sister Marjorie's debutante party that was coming up. Now her mother would offer to go with her. However, her mother had been very sick and often didn't leave the house because of this. So Dorothy told her, it's fine, you stay here. I will call if I find anything. And so at around 11 a.m., Dorothy headed out with about 25 to $30 in her pocket, which around this time would be about 600 to $800. And she headed down the street to buy her dress, to do a little bit of shopping. However, she would never return home. And when her family and friends caught wind that she could possibly be missing, her parents called everyone they possibly knew and no one knew where she was. This would be the first of Dorothy's parents' strange behavior because Dorothy wouldn't be reported missing, not even the day after. It's not like they just waited a day, they waited six weeks. And this was said to be because they didn't want to, you know, have a whole bunch of media attention if they weren't 100% sure that Dorothy was missing. They didn't want to be embarrassed if she came home the next day and they made a huge deal about it. So they were just going to wait to see if she came home. However, they didn't just sit there and do nothing. The next day they called a friend and lawyer named John S. Keith and he would come over and search the house, search her bedroom to see if he could find anything that was misplaced or looked out of place and that could connect to where she had gone and really nothing was gone from her bedroom besides the clothes that she wore that day. In her bedroom there was also personal letters with foreign postmarks on her desk and there was two folders for transatlantic streamliners that were sitting there as well and there was also papers that had been burned in her fireplace. Now, at this point, John was doing his own search around jails and morgues and hospitals, seeing if he could locate her. However, after weeks of doing this and coming up with nothing, John finally suggested that they go to private investigators. John, this entire time, had kept it from the media. However, he knew that he needed more help 
than what he could provide for them. Private detectives were called Pinkerton detectives at this time and John told the family, look, you need to locate them. You need to hire them so they can help you a little bit further. And he got in contact with them and the Pinkerton detectives, they searched hospitals and areas where she frequented and they also talked to friends and family and questioned them. However, even they could not find anything to do with her whereabouts or really any more information than John could. And at this point, they actually said, look, you need to go to local police because we're not finding anything either. Police found that that year that Dorothy went missing, she had actually been writing short stories and trying to get them published in local magazines. She went to the McClure's magazine and she sent in a short story. However, it was rejected. And after this, her family actually gave her a lot of grief for that, saying that she should basically give up and that they would never be good enough to be published in a magazine. And this really just knocked down her confidence and, and she got a post office box that was away from her home so she could get the letters from these publishers in case she was rejected so she wouldn't face any scrutiny from her family anymore. And at one point she even asked her father if she could have an apartment in Greenwich Village to do some writing. And her father said, no, a good writer can write anywhere. But in November, just a month before her disappearance, she had actually sent in another short story called Poinsettia and the Flame to the same magazine who rejected her once again. During this time, Dorothy also began to get close with another wealthy child named George Grissom. He wasn't really a child. He was still living with his family as well, so they had a lot in common and they began to get really close and even went using their parents' money and kind of pawning off things that were their families to get some money. They went on a trip to Boston for a week together that Dorothy's father did not approve of whatsoever. Four days before Dorothy's disappearance on December 8th, she spent the entire day with Marjorie addressing invitations for her debutante party. And then the next day she went to the Metropolitan Museum of Art and took $36 out of the bank. However, the day after that, she went to the city. She began looking for her dress. She also attended a matinee with some friends, had tea at the Waldorf Astoria, and possibly lunch at Sherry's with them as well. On December 11th, the day prior to her disappearance, she stayed home the whole day. She'd been doing a lot, and I'm sure she just wanted to get back her energy and to just have a me day because then on December 12th, she would leave once again to go look for this dress that she still had not found. And the day that she left, she was actually wearing a well-tailored suit with a blue serge coat and a tight hobble skirt and a matching color. She was also carrying a huge silver fox muff and a satin handbag. She wore a black velvet hat with two blue roses and a scalloped lace on it. Now, when her mother offered to go with her, she answered with, No, mother, don't bother. You don't feel just right, and it's no use going to the trouble. I mightn't see a thine I want, but if I do, I'll phone you. So in the icy winter of New York City, Dorothy actually walked 20 blocks from 79th Street in order to get to a chocolate store called Park and Tilford. And she got a half a pound of chocolate and she charged it to her family's account. The cashier didn't even have to ask her name. That's how much they frequent in this store. They had this account and this cashier said that she saw Dorothy put the chocolate in her silver fox muff and head out. It was noon now and 32 more blocks of walking would land her at 27th Street where she was going to the Britton Tano's bookstore. Now she picked up a book by Emily Calvin Blake called Engaged Girl Sketches. And the cashier said that Dorothy was fine, was acting completely normal at the time, and just checked out regularly. She also had an account there for her family, and so the cashier didn't really have to do much. It was now 2 p.m., and as Dorothy walked out of the bookstore, she ran into an old acquaintance named Gladys King. And they started talking about Marjorie's debutante party, and Gladys had been invited. She had gotten the letter, and she was actually going to send her acceptance or her, like, RSV back in the mail and she actually had it in her own muff and she pulled it out and she joked about getting to save on postage as she just handed it to Dorothy to take home without having to go through the mail to get to the Arnold household. 
and they spoke for a while and Dorothy was said to be in very good spirits and then Gladys was actually the one who said, oh, I'm meeting my mother at the Walford Astoria to have some lunch. I'm gonna have to go. And Dorothy said she was going to head home through Central Park. So they kind of both parted and Dorothy actually looked back a second time to wave at her friend and that would be the last time anyone would see Dorothy. It was said that Dorothy disappeared on one of the busiest streets at one of the sunniest hours with so many men and women and children at arm's grasp away from her and that officers were on all sides of the street that somebody would have seen anything and yet nobody did. Just after midnight that evening she disappeared so it had just turned midnight and gone into the 13th. Dorothy would get a call, well the, the Arnold residence, not really Dorothy, but Dorothy's friend, Elsie Henry, would call the Arnold residence because she had heard that Dorothy had gone missing. <clears throat> because, of course, Dorothy's family had been calling her friends to see where she was. And so Elsie called and said, has Dorothy come home yet? And Dorothy's mother picked up the phone and said, yes, she's home. And when Elsie said, can I speak to her? Dorothy's mother kind of paused and said, no, she's actually gone to bed with a headache. When her family then contacted the lawyer, John S. Keith, John was actually not very much older than Dorothy. In fact, only a few years and had often escorted Dorothy to several of the high society dances. Now, Dorothy's father said that he called John and John was saying, look, I'm kind of busy right now do I need to come right now or I'll just come later? And Dorothy's father said, no, it's urgent, this is serious. And so John decided to go and he searched her bedroom. And when they found the ashes of paper in the fireplace, Dorothy's father said, oh, it's probably just from a rejected manuscript that Dorothy burned. Now, when the Pinkerton detectives were on her case, they thought that maybe she had eloped with a man in Europe because there was a streamliners folders on her table and they looked into marriage records and they could not find any sign of Dorothy's name on any of these marriage records and they would search for her but they found women looking like her but not Dorothy herself. So six weeks later they would be reporting her missing finally to the actual police and investigators immediately ordered a press conference on January 25th of 1911 where this would be done outside of Francis, Dorothy's father's work and he would immediately say that there was a thousand dollar reward for any information regarding her whereabouts however he did believe his daughter was dead and that she had been spotted walking home through central station or through central park and had been tossed in the reservoir reporters began to ask him if he had any sort of belief that his daughter was still alive and that if he believed she could possibly still be with a man and then they started to say things like because you didn't let your daughter date because she could never have boys over and just kind of jabbing at him for his parenting style and at this point he said it's not true that i have objected to her having men call the house I would have been glad to see her associate more with young men than she did, especially some young men of brains and position, one whose profession or business would keep him occupied. I don't approve of young men who have nothing to do." Now he was really getting angry at this point because the press only seemed to care about Dorothy's personal life and they wanted to know if there was a man behind this angry statement saying, you know, that he didn't want Dorothy to be with a man who had nothing to do. And there in fact was a man that he was talking about and that was 42 year old George Grissom that we talked about earlier that she was in kind of a sort of fling relationship with. And the family disapproved of Dorothy and George's relationship so much and yet they continued to have one. And because of this, investigators began to look into George, who went by Junior, to see if he could possibly be a suspect. However, Junior was on vacation in Florence, Italy with, with his parents at the time and could not have gotten back in time. However, they had been exchanging letters the entire time he was away. And Dorothy wrote one to him saying, the magazine has turned me down. Failure stares me in the face. All I can see is a long road with no turning. Mother will always think there was an accident. 
The Arnold family sent four telegrams to Junior after Dorothy disappeared, asking him about Dorothy, if he knew anything about her disappearance or where she was, and he sent one back saying he didn't know anything about it. And also around this time, they, the Arnold family, actually traveled to Italy to talk to him in person, and they asked him for the letters. However, he said they had, n they had nothing important in them and he'd burned them. Junior told the press that he had planned to marry Dorothy when he got back from the vacation, as long as her mother approved of it, because obviously he wasn't gonna get his, her father to approve of it. But over the next few months, Junior actually spent thousands of dollars in newspaper ads talking to Dorothy to see if she would come forward knowing that he was looking for her. And she, when she never did, he had to move on with his life. But a witness at the hotel that Junior was staying at in Italy came forward saying that he had seen a young man and a veiled woman at this hotel with Junior. And it was said that the woman appeared agitated and almost looked like Dorothy. They all left together with a pack of letters and then one witness said that he had been near Junior when he was opening a letter from the Arnolds and he muttered under his breath, Arnold is making serious trouble. However, no evidence could ever be found to link Junior to any sort of crime. And then it was found that the veiled woman was actually Dorothy's mother and the man was Dorothy's older brother who had went to spy on Junior to see if Dorothy was actually coming to him. The police heard Francis's theory about that his daughter had possibly been thrown in the reservoir and they looked into this. However, it was found to be frozen at that time and she couldn't have been in there. But when it did thaw later on, they did go and search it and found nothing. But investigators strongly believed that Dorothy was alive and she would come home. They even sent out descriptions and the missing persons posters all throughout the United States. And this led to many tips, but none that led to Dorothy. The New York Times also stayed on top of this case as well and gave daily updates, which is probably what led to the Arnold family getting two ransom notes that were saying for $5,000, Dorothy would be returned to them. However, both of those turned out to be a hoax and there was also a rumor that Dorothy had been found. However, this was just a rumor, unfortunately. In February of 1911, Francis got a postcard signed from Dorothy from New York that said, I am safe. However, this was said to be in her handwriting, but Francis believed that it was just copied by someone who saw some sort of signature or handwriting of Dorothy's in the newspaper and he didn't believe it whatsoever. At this time, there was also a jeweler in San Francisco, California that came forward saying that Dorothy had come into his shop to have a wedding ring engraved with 2AJA from ERB, December 10th, 1910, which was two days prior to her disappearance. Two and a half months into this investigation though, the police announced that they would stop investigating her disappearance because not a single clue had been found and they now believed that Dorothy was deceased. In 1916, a prisoner from Rhode Island came forward saying that he had been hired for $250 to bury a wealthy woman in a cellar. And this was in December of 1910 when Dorothy disappeared. However, when he was questioned, he had very little details and very little evidence to back it up and so it was just kind of ruled out but there were many theories about this case i mean the main one being that she was abducted and possibly killed however where she disappeared from was in the middle of a busy street you'd think that someone would have heard something but nobody remembers her that day at all except for the very few people she came in direct contact with. And you think that if Dorothy was so healthy and exercised so regularly that she could literally walk so many miles just to go to a store, you'd think that she would be healthy enough to fight back if someone was attacking her. However, I mean, it depends on the situation, but you'd think that she would have caused enough just chaos and of a fight that somebody would have noticed and nobody did. Some people say that possibly she committed suicide because of her failing writing career or because she wasn't allowed to see Junior. However, nobody's have ever washed up on shore. Her body's never been found. And she was pretty much in good spirits all the time, except for when she was talking about her writing, which she was being 
rejected in, which makes sense. Mental illness is a tricky thing. Sometimes you can put on a face all the time and then truly be so sad when you're not around people and you don't want to show that part of yourself to them. So it definitely could be. I mean, if she felt, if her family was making fun of her for the one thing that she loved and she was being rejected for that as well, maybe she did think that her only option was to take her own life, which I hope all of you out there know that that's not your only option, but maybe in this situation she didn't have anyone to tell her otherwise. Another theory was that she actually fell on icy pavement and hit her head, got amnesia, but no women ever showed up in hospitals not knowing who they were. There were no news of, you know, women who were completely unidentified in the area at the time. And so this was kind of ruled out as well. Some people say that she was actually pregnant with Junior's kid and she went to a clinic to get an abortion and that is what ultimately killed her. It was kind of an illegal underground abortion. And there was actually a clinic working out of, out of a basement in Pennsylvania and it was called the House of Mystery because it was later found that many women went missing from here because they'd either died or possibly some darker theories. But there was a doctor named H.E. Lutz who said that Dorothy had died at that clinic from complications. He said that her body had been burned in a furnace as many of the bodies who have women who passed away went but this couldn't be confirmed either. In 1921, something very strange happened and the head of the New York City Police Department of Missing Persons, they were doing an interview. It was a speech for kids and they basically were talking about the Dorothy Arnold disappearance and he had said that the real truth about Dorothy Arnold had been known for months to family and friends. And when this was asked to be elaborated on later on, He's denied saying that and said, oh, it was just a mishap and I didn't mean to say that and refused to admit what he had said. 25 years after her disappearance, on December 11th, 1935, there was actually a tip called in saying that Dorothy had been spotted on 5th Avenue and 53rd Street, but investigators immediately swarmed the area and searched and found nothing. Now, this was a day prior to her 25th anniversary, so... This could have just been a hoax, somebody who knew about this disappearance and wanted to get back at the Arnold family or wanted to, you never know, the people are strange and that could have been the reason why. Or I mean, it could have been Dorothy herself 25 years later going back to the place that she ran away from if it was maybe just a runaway. And this is where her case ends. Dorothy Arnold has never been found and no one knows what exactly happened to her that day or at least no one has come forward with that information. But what do you think happened? I mean, unfortunately, I do think the suicide theory is something that could be plausible. She was struggling with her career, with her family, and her family didn't even want her to be with somebody she loved, and all those things stacking up against her could have possibly led to that. I don't want that to be the truth, but I do think it could be. It is strange that nobody found her body. However, if she did walk so many blocks just to go to a store, maybe she walked so many blocks so nobody could find her body. I almost do just have this strange feeling about her family. Now, I know that wealthy people can be very weird about press, about their personal life getting out, about their status and how people perceive them, but it's just strange to me that not only did her family wait six weeks to report her missing, but they also told one of her friends that she was home when she wasn't. And I don't know, maybe Dorothy did get home that day and an accident occurred with her family, or maybe even a murder, and they covered it up from there. And maybe they covered it up and they went through their lawyer friend first and then the private detectives to make sure that they covered it up well before going to the actual police knowing that they could get away with it at that point. Because both of the other two had said, look, we haven't found anything. And so they're like, oh, perfect. Well, we, we did it. We got away with it. I mean, all the theories in this case just, they're disturbing and they're sad. I can't believe that it's been so long and we still have no idea what happened to her, but I'd love to hear your theories down below. Don't ever forget to speak up. Your voice is powerful enough and I love you to absolute pieces. Okay, bye.